we started. Great, thank you. Um, thanks everyone for joining us. I don't wanna take um, too much time with unnecessary frills, but um, I'll go ahead and, and in respect to time and those who are here, start uh, our little intro. Um, and then that way we can leave as much time as possible to hear from our, our um, esteemed guests who are joining us today. So welcome. Buenvenidos, <laughs> welcome, um, whatever language you speak, all are welcome here in the land of, or I call it Zoomlandia. <laughs> um, for those who aren't familiar, and even for those who are, just a friendly reminder that these are some of the folks behind the scenes who are um, keeping the association um, intact, and also um, those not listed include um, Kurt Freda, who is our IT tech um, guru for the day. And um, so he'll be in the background. If you have any concerns or questions or have difficulty with anything tech related, if possible, you can um, put into the chat and you can send it to host and panelists and he'll be able to see that. Um, also, uh, we will be um, asking folks to put their questions into the Q&A. And so if you scroll to the bottom of your screen, you'll be able to see a Q&A button that you can click on and then you can type your question um, and it'll put it in a queue and that way it helps us to collate those um, versus trying to hunt for them in the chat. Um, but feel free to use the chat for any other kind of comments or, or um, items that you just um, feel compelled to share. But questions, please do put in the in the Q&A so that we can um, keep track of those. And then we'll we'll take time after each presenter to uh, to review those questions and, and give them an opportunity to respond. Um, today, we are welcoming Roderick Wheatley, who's a um, beekeeper in Normandy, France, um, and also John Thorpe, who's with the Native Irish Honeybee um, Society. And both will be talking about their um, respective programs in their countries um, and uh, in in their beekeeping communities that they work alongside. And so I'm really excited to have them both on. Um, I will share this, that I, I got to meet Roderick in person. Um, was it 2015, Roderick? But it, uh, I think so, 2015 or 2016, I forget. Now. Yeah, right in there, um, mm -hmm. in Normandy, actually, in Diette. And I, I got to go to the um, uh, Anarsea, or as it's translated, you know, basically the French uh, Queen Breeders Association, and he was my translator. So that was <laughs> that was wonderful. I can read French. I can uh, really rudimentarily speak it, you know. Um, but um, I was very happy to to have his services there, and um, and he became a friend. And so I I remembered now years later. Um, and we reconnected on LinkedIn and I thought, oh, you know, maybe he would like to give a presentation. And mm -hmm. that's also um, slightly similar in how I reached out to um, John Thorpe was through LinkedIn. So for those of you who um, maybe are not on LinkedIn, if you want to check it out, it's a it's a professional platform where um, folks can connect by their their careers or their professions and there's lovely groups on there who talk about beekeeping around the globe or or share their um share their information that way so um i always uh like to check that out for for meeting interesting folks all over the world who are into um bees and beekeeping all right i'm going to stop share and um we'll start with um, our presenter here, number one, is going to be Roderick, and I'm going to read a, a short little bio for him. <laughs> Very short. No, it's great. I mean, you know, you've lived a long life, so it's how do you synthesize it? And I think you did a great job at condensing condensing it for this purpose. So um, I have a problem of going on and on, so I, I will rein myself in right now. <laughs> but, so we welcome to... Um, to the WASP mini conference series, uh, Roderick Wheatley. He studied English at Caen in University. He is a British citizen, but has lived in France since 1989. He works as a translator and a semi-professional beekeeper, and he specializes in the selection of breeding black bees. Currently, he has 84 colonies, all in the Livero area of Calvado. He's involved in the regional Apis mellifera conservation project, including the setting up of a new conservation areas and mating sites. He coordinates the work of the Calvados team board member of the Normandy Breeds Federation and regional government funded support organization, which encourages the use of local breeds, including the black bee. So 
um, with with that, I will let you take the take the stage, Roderick. Thank you so much for joining us. I know it's uh, early evening well, your time. I'm, I'm I'm very flattered. I'm, I'm, when I look at my your previous um, presenters, I think, wow, they're all doctors, professors, and everything. I'm very flattered. I'm a little Normandy for beekeeper. <laughs> I'm very flattered to be invited. It's great. Um, just a couple of points. My presentation were divided into two parts. Um, and I'd be very happy to answer questions at the end of the first part. You'll see a slide come up saying any questions. And if perhaps Kurt could then uh, relay questions to me at that point about the presentation about the bee itself, its history and where it is now and what it's like and, and so on. So I'll start by sharing my screen and hopefully you'll see my PowerPoint presentation. You can see it now. Yeah. Okay. So, as Melanie said, we're talking about Apis mellifera mellifera. Um, it's sometimes known as the black bee, sometimes as the European dark bee. As you can see, it is pretty dark in color. There's no yellow on it normally. Um, and it's pretty hairy. It, it deals with all sorts of climates, as we'll see later on. It's very good at. Um, keeping warm and working in all weathers. Now, the Western honeybee, Apis mellifera, is the bee that evolved in all parts of Europe um, a long, long time ago. And it's since separated up into subspecies, which I'm sure you're all familiar with. We're not entirely sure about where this bee, Apis mellifera, exactly evolved, but it's pretty certain at least in my mind, that it was somewhere in the Middle East. And then uh, the different groups of Apis mellifera went their separate ways around Europe and into Asia. Genome analysis today gives a much better idea of uh, how that family tree evolved, um, because we can now look, see uh, genetic markers in each of the populations of bees. We can see traces of where each of the families of bees have been in the past. There is a debate about um, how the black bee got to its present uh, territory. Um, I'll show you on a map in a minute um, how, about that discussion. But the result is we've ended up with four groups, quite distinct groups of honeybees, all part of the Apis mellifera clan. Um, let's start with Africa. Um, I've just shown three main subspecies there. The one you're probably most familiar with is Scutellata, which is responsible for the Africanized bees uh, that you get in South America and in North America. Um, in its own territory, it's not quite as vicious as when it's bred with other, uh, crossed with other species. In the Middle East, the group AO, you've got two quite well-known bees. You've got the Caucasian bee, Caucasica, and the Anatolian bee in Turkey, uh, Anatolica, Anatolica. They are both useful bees and they're both been used in uh, hybrids such as uh, the buckfast, particularly Anatolica um, has been used in the buckfast. Then the ones you're most familiar with, the Eastern group, uh, group C, includes Ligustica, the Italian bee, and Carnica, the Carniolan bee. But there is also Macedonica and various other smaller groups within that group there. And then the one I'm interested in is the group M, uh, Apis mellifera iberiensis, which is the Spanish black bee, very close cousin of Apis mellifera mellifera, which is the, the, the European dark bee. I'll show you where they are in a second. Now, the debate about how these things evolved, um, there was a wonderful researcher, Professor Friedrich Ratner, who was working in Austria and Germany uh, in the 60s and 70s. And he had obviously no access to DNA analysis. So he was doing everything by morphometric examination of the bees. And he suggested that um, the uh, Western honeybee evolved somewhere in the Middle East, let's say Egypt or around that area, and migrated um, from there into Africa um, and into Asia, where the group O were, were formed, and the group C in, in Central Europe. He suggested that our black bee, the mellifera, 
migrated through Africa up into Western Europe. The second um, image at the bottom is a, another suggestion made by Professor Lionel Garnery working um, in Paris, and he had access to DNA analysis. And he thinks they had a much more central and common ancestor, uh, still in the Middle East somewhere, uh, but the migration into Africa was quite apart from the rest. And he suggests that the black bee mellifera went northwards into Russia and then came across the whole of Northern Europe into France and in, eventually into Spain. There is another theory um, that everything happened in Africa like human beings and moved out of Africa to form the various groups. Um, I, I don't support that theory. I, I, th I prefer Garnery's principle. Um, what we ended up with was the various groups in a map like this. The only doubt, I don't know if you can see my cursor, is how the black bee, which is a mellifera, uh, actually moved. Did it move, first of all, north of the Himalayas into Asia and then back across to Europe? Or did it go straight up through Turkey and Georgia into Russia and Poland that way? They're not sure. Um, it, it's still not still quite a lot of debate about that. Once all these various four, uh, subspecies had formed, we then, at about 115,000 years ago, we entered a new ice age, the last ice age. And that really put um, a, a, a huge change on the planet generally. But in Europe, um, the ice cap came down over most of the British Isles, what is now Denmark and northern Germany. Um, all the ocean, the Atlantic Ocean was, um, was pack ice as well. And that really limited the, the territory that our bees could exploit. Because not only was there ice, but south of that ice cap, for about a thousand kilometers or so, was just tundra with no trees. Um, and nowhere for our cavity nesting bees to set up home. Um, it was much like northern uh, climates are today in Norway and Scotland and so on. It, it's a lot of heath, um, no trees and very little shelter for bees. So they couldn't exploit that territory. And we think that the mellifera, the black bees, were confined to an area down in the south of France um, pinned there by the, the Pyrenean mountains and the Massif Central, um, they, they lived here for thousands of years. I mean, the Ice Age lasted actually for nearly 100,000 years, and they evolved quite separately from all the others. Uh, the Italian bee, Ligustica, was held to the south by the presence of the Alps. The Carnica, the Carniolan bee, was here, uh, again, enclosed by mountain ranges. The Macedonica was here, but all that band there was completely devoid of bees because it was so cold and there was nothing there for them. It wasn't until forest finally made its way northwards as the, the ice pack melted um, that bees could start moving northwards as well. I should just say where they were down near the Pyrenees, they estimate that uh, daytime temperatures never exceeded 12 degrees centigrade, which is what, 56 uh, Fahrenheit. Um, so they were pretty hardy to live down there. Um, they were very good at ex exploiting what little flora there was, and they were pretty hardy to uh, live in those temperatures. So today, this is the area covered by the different subspecies. You can see there's quite a lot, lot of them. Um, in the different islands, the different subspecies evolved. The principal ones that interest us today are uh, the Carnica, the Carniolan, the Italian, and the Mellifera bees. Uh, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on the different subspecies because I'm, I'm sure you know them all very well, but just in quick introduction, the Caucasian bee uh, northern Turkey and in Georgia is essentially a mountain bee. It's a big bee. It has the longest tongue reach of all the bees that we know. Uh, it's able to get into red clover and alfalfa and so on. Uh, you can see the bodies of the workers are quite long and pointed. Um, my next photograph is a little out of focus, but it was just to illustrate. Here's a Caucasian bee uh, that I had. Um, it was collecting pollen of a, a maize, a, a sweet corn. And you can see the length of its body and how pointed it is. It, it's, it's quite a substantial bee. Very, very 
easy to manipulate in its pure state, but horrible once it starts crossing with other, with other bees. The Carnica, the Carniolan bee, is a mountain bee, essentially, a very sweet tempered, um, tends to swarm quite early in the spring in its natural state, although with a bit of selection, it's now getting better. Uh, but a, a good bee, but this is all, this is part of the, the C group, like uh, the Italian bee. This one you'll all be familiar with, the Italian bee, renowned for its uh, brood production, uh, very, very useful for pollination work because it can produce uh, tons of young bees quite early on in the season, as you'll know in California from the almond uh, pollination work. Then the Spanish cousin, the black uh, bee of, uh, of Spain, the uh, Apis mellifera iberiensis, uh, very good at exploiting its territory. It lives on the south side of the Pyrenees, particularly. Um, I've tried bringing some up further north, and it's completely hopeless up here. It's just not designed for our climate. It doesn't, doesn't work well at all up here. Now, I must talk about Buckfast. Um, the Buckfast bee was a, a human invention. A German monk working in the southwest of England um, had been had lost a lot of colonies, like a lot of other beekeepers in England at the time. This was the beginning of the 20th century. Lost a lot of colonies to the Isle of Wight disease. And he found that Italian bees were resistant to that disease. So he got some Italian queens. He got them mated by native British black males. And that was the beginning of his work, creating a new hybrid subspecies. I, I, in my name here, I put Apis mellifera x buckfast to denote that it's a hybrid. Since those first crosses, um, Brother Adam integrated various other subspecies from around Europe and even from Africa, uh, each time trying to uh, get the best characteristics out of um, those different subspecies. And by a system of uh, outcrossing and then recombination work, was able to integrate them into the buckfast. There is no doubt that the buckfast is an exceptional bee when it's well bred. Um, most professionals in France use it for um, their migratory beekeeping work. It's reputed to be very sweet tempered. It accepts being moved around and exploiting a new territory. It produces quite large colonies, probably 90,000 bees in the hive at any one time. And because of that, those numbers can fill up honey supers quite quickly. The only disadvantage from my point of view is that um, I see professional beekeepers feeding um, these bees quite massively once they come back from their migratory um, honey production. And then finally, our little European dark bee or the black bee. You can see how short it is compared to the others. Um, it's quite short and stubby and round. Uh, it's uh, very good at living in colder climates. It's hard working, even in poor weather conditions. Now, this is a photograph I took in February, 11th of February, when it was eight degrees outside, which is 48 in, in Fahrenheit. And these, this little colony was collecting pollen from hazel trees, the first pollen we get each year. Um, it's not particularly rich in protein, but it's the first uh, pollen we get which starts things off, the starts the queen laying again. Uh, quite remarkable, the, the, the slightest bit of sunshine and they're out. The advantage of having a dark body is they absorb heat from the sun very, very quickly and can get out. I've also seen them working in, in rain, and mist and everything. They're, they're remarkably keen to get out and work. Parsimonious, it's a lovely word. Um, it means they're extremely economical with their reserves. They, they, uh, I don't feed my bees generally. Um, they, they make enough honey during the summer to live uh, through the winter. Um, they eke out their supplies. They're very um, economical with their brood as well. They never have too much brood in the hive. They stop laying, generally mine stop laying sometime in November and only start again with the um, hazel pollen, which we get in, in, in the beginning of the year. That means I can do my varroa um, treatment at Christmas time. I use oxalic acid 
I'm incidentally, I'm, I use, I'm in organic uh, beekeeping. I use oxalic acid at Christmas time um, when I'm be pretty confident that there are no, there's no brood in the hive. It's a very hardy bee, lives in remarkably um, extreme temperatures. Um, and it is, also lives longer than other subspecies. I'm not sure why, but it does. Um, it, it, perhaps it's because it's more economical with its energy uh, expenditure, I don't know, but it does live longer. Last year, I had a queen in an observation hive for my talks, and she was nearly five years old, and she was still laying eggs in public, which is, which is lovely to see. So there's some of my hives out in the snow. This, we haven't had snow this year, but there's a couple of years ago, we had a really good snowfall. I don't insulate my hives. Um, those particular ones have chalet roofs. Um, incidentally, all my hives are, I think you pronounce it dadent or dadent in, in America, um, dadant in French. They're all 10 frames in the body. The total volume of a dadent um, brood chamber is less, in fact, than two Langstroth uh, deeps. So um, it suits suits the black bee perfectly, and and even bigger col bigger uh, colonies such as the you get with buckfast, they, they seem to be quite happy in ten frame hives like this. And this is the standard hive right across France. Most most people use the dead and hive. Um, I had these with chalet roofs to look pretty. This was at a private estate and they wanted bees to look pretty, so I use, but generally they have flat roofs. It adapts to a very large variety of environments. I think John Thorpe is going to talk to us more about that in a, in a while, but when you look at their range from the Pyrenees in the south up to Norway in the north and the west coast of Ireland um, right through to the Ural Mountains in Russia, that's a huge range of, of environments, and each uh, ecotype of, of the black bee is very specific in the way it, um, it manages uh, its brood and its um, honey production and so on, uh, according to its environment. It's remarkable how it is adapted. Very rarely needs feeding, as I say. I do feed my younger colonies to help them build up enough um, bees to get through the first winter, but otherwise hardly ever. One of the remarkable things about black bees is the way they organize their frames. They don't have, you don't find a whole block of brood right up to the frame in, in a black bee colony. They generally have um, brood in the middle, um, a band of pollen around it, and then a band of, of honey around the top of the frame. That means they have very little walking to go and find reserves to feed their brood, uh, which is again, very economical. This colony, by the way, is polluted. I don't know if you spotted already, but there are some bees like that one and that one and this one and this one, which have obviously the queen is black, but obviously one or two yellow males got in with her when the, when she was being mated. And that pollutes the, unfortunately, pollutes the colony. They can still be used for making black males because the, the males come from unfertilized eggs. But um, <clears throat> I would never try and graft for new queens on a colony like that because there's a good risk I'll get polluted queens as well. In its pure state, despite its reputation, the black bee is actually very gentle. Um, it, it, a few years ago, when I first started seriously selecting black bees, some of my apiaries I was frightened to go into. To be honest, I, I would. I put my hood up, uh, my, my veil up before I got out of my car, it was that bad. But with a few years of selection, I've got back to pure black bees and they are really very, very gentle. They're no more aggressive than any other sort of bees. I don't go into the hives when it's about to be a storm or it's particularly cold and windy. They, they don't like that, no, but no bees do. So here you are, there's me visiting a hive. Um, with no gloves on. My smoker is on the ground next to the hive. I don't need it. Um, you can see the bees are, are clinging to the, the frame very nicely. Um, this is in the spring. Um, so you can see they've got their brood right at the front of the frame, just above the doorway, the doorway's down here. And they've got honey on the brood frame. Um, so they haven't got far to go to, to feed their larvae. What I do, once the warmer come, weather comes, I turn that frame round and so to encourage the queen to lay on the rest of the, the frame. Otherwise they sort of, it's a bit limited, they're a bit limited for space. 
but they are a very sweet tempered bee once uh, once you start breeding pure black bees. It modifies its brood production according to nectar availability. That's important. Um, it doesn't carry on laying. The queen will not carry on laying willy nilly. If the if there's no uh, nectar, which we had last year, we had a, a, a serious drought through last summer, and the normal um, flowering of the the clover, the white clover we get all during the summer, just never happened. It was just too dry, and the queens stopped laying. They they they, they packed up. They said no, that's enough, thank you. Um, and so there was a big gap in brood. It's quite normal we get a gap in brood um, in August. I, I'm able to take, I take two holidays, two weeks holiday a year, um, and I go in the second half of August. I do my summer varroa mite treatment before I go. I use formic acid in the summer. In um, I use formic pro, what used to be known as max. Um, and then I go on holiday and nothing, I know is nothing is happening in the hive during that last part, part of August. And it's not until the 15th of um, September, roughly, that the queen will start laying again. Um, and that corresponds to the flowering of the ivy. There's lots and lots of ivy here in the old trees and, and hedges. And that last um, honey flow of the year, the ivy, is very, very important to uh, in the production of winter bees, the, the ones that accompany the queen through the winter. It's extremely good at exploiting lots of small honey flows. Um, I would never dream of using black bees, for example, for pollination work. Um, they're not, they're not that sort, they're not bulk feeders. They will uh, explore quite a large territory, um, about three kilometers, two miles or so, um, round the, the hive, and they'll, um, forage on, on whatever happens to be going in the hedgerows or in the in the flower meadows. And their foraging range is slightly larger than other subspecies. Again, we're not quite sure why, but they they just, it, uh, and it's their habit to go a bit further. I had, um, a couple of years ago, I had um, an acre of um, facility sown and I found Facelia, um, Facelia sorry, in, in English, uh, Facelia pollen in one of my, um, apiaries which was over three kilometers away and I know I was the only one growing it that year so it shows that they'd come quite a long way to collect the pollen quite obvious the color of the pollen so let's talk a bit about the physical characteristics of the bee um, it's very dark color of course um, quite variable between black and dark brown there's one in Normandy um, you can see the sort of color we expect um, them to be no no signs of yellow that is not yellow, that's hair on, on the body. They're very hairy because of the, the, war, the colder weather they had to put up with. Um, that's quite a young bee, I guess. They don't, they don't stay that hairy when they, they've done a few weeks foraging. Uh, that color pollen, I would expect to see on dandelions particularly. The dandelions will start flowering here in about four, three or four weeks. And you see masses of this dark orange pollen coming in, it's wonderful. They have a short rounded abdomen and a very a, a unique wing vein pattern. Now, there's a debate about why that evolved. They think this particular wing is more efficient to uh, flying in colder air. That's the theory, at least. But whatever the reason, they've ended up with a, a wing vein pattern, which is quite different from all the others. And there are two particular measurements on the wing that are, make it different. First of all, what we call cubital index, that's the cubital cell of the wing, that big one there. The cubital index is this length here, I've marked as A, divided by this length here, B. And in no case, the black B would ever, that ratio be more than two. So A divided by B would always be less than two. I would expect in most of my colonies that the average for that colony to be about 1.6. The other key point is that if you take a perpendicular from that line, which goes through this point here, the bottom edge of the cubital cell will always be closer to the body of the bee in a black bee and further away from that perpendicular line in the case of uh, Italian and, and carniolan bees, for example. 
And that is, that's unique. It's the only B that has a neg what they call a negative value for the discoidal shift. So any questions on that at the moment? Uh, my introduction to the, uh, to the black B. Zach, have you got any questions? Kurt, sorry, have you got any questions? There, there are a few in the chat. Um, so I'll, I'll kind of moderate them here. We've got one from Anthony who's asking, and this is referring um, to the migration slides you were sharing, which I, I often refer to that research too, because I love that paper. Um, mm. Are you saying that all of this migration is natural migration or is some of it man-made yeah. with intentional movement? I think so, Melody. At the time it happened, the, when the original uh, divergence of the sp subspecies happened, I don't think there was any active beekeeping going on. This was before the Ice Age, um, and I think that uh, man's intervention came a bit later on. I think this was natural migration over a long period of time, thousands of years. John, John's going to perhaps enlighten us on that one. John, I see, see you there. Hi. Um, but yes, I think it's natural migration initially before before men got involved. Right, and I know we've we've sped up, especially when you look at stateside. We've we've done it really willy nilly. So you know, the yeah, man made yeah. aspect is very uh, man made or man induced movement is very different depending on but, where you are in the world. Um, here's another question from Gordon: When people refer to the Russian bee, is that really um, Apis from Lifra? Um, no, it's a mixture, to be honest. I, I think what we're talking about, are we talking about Primorsky bees? The, from the, uh... um, well, I, I, it must have been in reference to what you were talking about, but I, I heard similarly too, yeah, that even the, the quote-unquote Russian strain is not really its own ecotype, that it's no. a blend. Right. Up until up to the Ural Mountains, um, it's generally uh, taken to be Black Bee territory. Um what happened in the east of Russia was quite different because um, settlers from um, the European Russia moved right to the east and in an area called the Primorsky region, they brought with them bees from everywhere. Um, in southern Russia and Georgia, they had the Caucasian bee. Um, in North and western Russia, they had the black bee. And all these bees were taken over to the east and for the first time, the Western honeybee came into contact with the varroa mite. Um, the local bee, Apis serrana, had been dealing with it for years and had developed tactics for coping with the varroa population. But the, our, our Western honeybee had no idea what to do. And it was only by uh, survival that a, a strain of bees evolved, sometimes called the Primorsky bee. But really, they're not a pure race they're they're a mixture of caucasian and mellifera bees it's generally yeah. thought, you know. that's what that's what i had heard too yeah mm -hmm. um which is very interesting because yeah here in the states they're kind of i want to say they're promoted as their own type of strain um but yet they are a blend <laughs> so. they're, they're, they're they're interesting in breeding work because they're very resistant to um varroa mites um, personally, I've had some I've had some Primorsky buckfast crosses, which were fantastic at, at uh, looking after hmm. um, the varroa population, but their behavior was a little bit um, jumpy, let's say. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Interesting to hear you say that. Well, I think I might save the there's a few other questions, but I think we can save those towards. Um, OK, towards the very so, end. But yeah. All right. Okay. So we'll, we'll go on to talk about conservation work. Yes. So first of all, let's ask some questions. Why is Apis mellifera mellifera in danger? Well, like all bees, um, our bee is suffering from environmental changes. I don't really need to go into great detail about that. We've got climate change. We've got um, uh, vegetation change from, because of agriculture, hedges being ripped out, woods being cut down, um, even pasture being re-sown with, with uh, mono uh, varieties of, of grass, you know, with no flowers, and it, it all changes um, the, the environment for the bee. Like all bees, the dark, the dark bee is also suffering from the effects of exposure to pesticides, herbicides, fungicides, all used in agriculture. These are all pretty disastrous. Even if they don't actually kill the bee um, directly, they can render a, a bee colony extremely vulnerable to viral um, infections. Um, I have had 
grain of carp. Um, they grow a lot of um, oilseed rape. I think you call it canola uh, in the States. And they, they treat this um, crop with a fungicide to stop mildew forming. Um, the bees, by taking pollen and nectar back to the hive, uh, inevitably carry some of this fungicide back. And it leads to them being extremely vulnerable to uh, bee paralysis virus. And I've got some film of, of you know, colonies completely collapsed to the bottom of the hive, all trembling. It's horrible to see. And in every single case I've sent off a lab analysis, we found the presence of, of a fungicide used on um, oilseed rape. So it doesn't kill the bee uh, directly, but it does make them extremely susceptible to other things. Like all bees, the dark bee is suffering from infestation by varroa mites. We all know that. I don't need to talk about that very much. Um, now, a new one for us, it's for about 10, 12 years. Um, on the western side of continental Europe, the dark bee is suffering from predation by the Asian hornet, Vespa velituna nigrothorax. Uh, they came in by accident in the Bordeaux region of France and uh, the southwest. Probably um, hibernating queens came in on a shipment of pottery and... We don't know how many of the were, perhaps 10, 12 uh, initially, but they've spread all the way up the west side of France into as far as Belgium, and now stretching across the most of France and into Italy. Even. And that's what it looks like. It's a black thorax, like its name suggests, yellow ends to its legs. Um, the abdomen is variable. I've had a colony last year, which was nearly all black, um, another colony which was had a t um, mostly mostly yellow with a, a one little bit of black at the end here, very variable. They always have a black thorax and yellow feet. Um, if there's time at the end, I can show you a video of these guys in action in one of my apiaries. It's pretty frightening. Most of all, though, the dark bee is in danger of disappearing because of genetic pollution by other subspecies imported into its territory. I can't stress that enough. Fifty years ago. Everybody in France, pretty much, um, was using Apis mellifera mellifera. Um, and then it became fashionable to start using other bees, such as Italian and Caucasian and uh, Carniola and so on. And the different subspecies interbreed very easily. Um, no problem at all. But the trouble is that um, very quickly, the, the population of dark bees uh, became polluted and were no longer were no longer pure so panic stations uh, suddenly we're going to have we've had to start we started in this area probably about 10 15 years ago but really got our act together about five years ago on um, selecting seeking out um, pure colonies and breeding from them um, and uh, so we'll talk about that project now this is an example of a polluted colony. Uh, you've got a queen who has got yellow stripes on her. You've got some workers with yellow, one band of yellow, one band, one band, three bands. Then you've got some workers with no yellow on them at all, like that one and that one. It's a real mishmash. Um, the breeder of buckfast bees, the inventor of buckfast bees, brother Adam, referred to these colonies as mongrel, and he wasn't far wrong. There's another one, um, a little bee with, with a band of yellow on its first signal. So how can we help? How can we save this, this precious black bee? It's, an, it's a species. It's not, not a man-made animal. It's a, it's a species. First job, and it, whatever your aim is, I'm, I'll talk to you about your own schemes later on, but even if, it, if it's not conservation work, if it's um, improvement work or, or whatever, you have to communicate with the public and with other beekeepers so they're all aware of your problems or, or the problems of facing you when you're in your selection work, in our case, the dark bee. You have to lobby national and regional governments to get their support and legal protection. Now, John Thorpe represents the Irish group and they're fantastic at this. They've done a wonderful job and he's gonna tell you all about that, I'm sure, later on. Uh, we have to create conservation zones where the dark bee can be bred in relative safety. Um, none of these conservation zones are 100% watertight, but they're, they're not bad. We, I'll show you how we work later on. Uh, we use DNA analysis to ensure a minimum of uh, um, genetic introgression in, in the, um, particularly the mitochondria, but in the microsatellites, uh, 
in, in the bees. It's very important that when, we, when we're multiplying from uh, queens that we know that all the new queens are going to be pure and not carrying um, genetic pollution. We multiply the pure stocks and distribute new queens. Now, I say multiply, we've got to be very, very careful not to limit the, the gene pool available within the, the subspecies. When I say multiply, I work from about 10 different stocks in my particular patch here um, in Livoro. I work from 10 different pure stocks and do 20 or 30 queens a week from each, really no more than that. I'm just, and I use some of them to um, replace my older queens, some to set up new colonies, but I give the rest away to beekeepers in the area um, so they can maintain pure stock. But we don't want to produce thousands and thousands of queens, sister queens, from one or two stocks because we'd lose valuable genes um, and uh, to be avoided at all costs in conservation. And we'll want to create safe mating sites. I'll go on to that in a bit because it's, it's very exciting with our new project we've got. But it's important to be able to have sites where we can take our virgin queens and the only males available to them will be uh, from our own selection. There is, of course, the option of um, insemination, instrumental insem insemination, which is great, but you have to be, again, very careful not to limit the number of genes that you're producing, no, you're multiplying. Also, the last point here, we need to encourage professional beekeepers to use uh, mellifera. Now, I've already said they're not particularly adapted to pollination work, the, the mellifera, but there is a huge demand for new colonies um, for the amateur market. I mean, we're talking about uh, for a, an overwintered uh, colony on four frames, uh, probably 175 to 190 euros uh, a colony, and there's a waiting list for them. Um, so it's a very interesting proposition for a professional beekeeper to get hold of a pure stock and to uh, produce new colonies for sale. Now the Normandy project, just to remind you where Normandy is, um, there's a map of Western Europe. Normandy is due south of London, um, due west of Paris. It's composed of five counties called Départements here in France. Um, and it looks like this. It's very typically um, what's called a bocage, small pastures surrounded by trees and very mature hedges. It's, it's very pretty, rolling countryside um, and lots of old overgrown hedges, which is great for the bees. It's not professional beekeeping country because it's not, there's no one big honey flow. You're not gonna to produce tons of honey. My, my colonies produce between 50 and 75 kilos of honey the, um, a, a season, that's spring and summer honey combined. And that's in stationary uh, beekeeping. It's pretty good. It's, I'm very happy with that sort of uh, harvest but I'll never produce five, six um, supers of honey. Uh, it just doesn't happen here. We, we, I've got no rapeseed oil, canola. I've got no other, uh, I've got no sunflowers, um, no other big flowering crops. So it's just, it's just perfect for, bee, for black bees. The other thing, uh, as Melanie was saying before we started tonight, the, uh, today, sorry, um, the apples, the Normandy is famous for his apples. Uh, there are apple orchards everywhere around here. It's very pretty in the springtime when they're all in flower. They're mainly, um, they're not eating apples, but they're mainly cider apples here. Um, the, the we have, where I am in Livero, there is a cider factory and also a distillery for making Calvados um, liqueur, which is, um, I think you call it Applejack, but it's uh, um, an apple-based uh, spirit. So in 2017, we got together, uh, the five departements of Normandy, we got together and created a new federation called Abbe Noir de Normandy. Um, and the aim was to work together um, to, in our conservation project, uh, because we're all by ourselves, all working in our separate little corners. It didn't, it wasn't, we weren't making any progress at Save the Bee. We were, in fact, losing the battle. There were fewer and fewer pure colonies each year. So we got together and we started exchanging genetic material. We started working together on mating sites and so on. And today we have one, two, three, four, five conservation areas already set up. 
Um, each conservation area, I'll just explain briefly, uh, as a central point, a three kilometer radius around the central point, which is the heart zone of the, uh, the conservation area. And there we aim to have 100% black bee colonies. And then we have a 10 kilometer radius zone around that called the buffer zone. And there we try to get 80% at least um, of black bee colonies. So we've got five set up already. And then our projects for this year, are to, there's another one I've got, to, I'm giving a talk on the 14th of April to start up a new zone here, uh, which fits in very nicely with the other three around it. A new zone in the north of the Manche Departement. And the big exciting news is this, we've just signed a deal. This is a bunch of rocks out in the Atlantic Ocean, uh, 15, 17 kilometers, just over 10 miles from the coast. Um, and the main island in this group is called Chose, and it's privately owned. And we've just signed a deal with the owners um, for three years, giving us exclusive access to the island. Um, and that's what it looks like. It's tiny, as you can see, there really isn't much there. It's basically rock. Um, but they have, over the years, grown some trees on it. Um, the wind comes off the Atlantic in this direction, and these are quite tall trees. So we're going to use this as a mating site. We're going to put male condies here, and we're going to put all our mating nuclei uh, right here in the protection of the trees. We're going to give it a go. We're going to see, we're going to start off small. We're going to put 50 new queens every two weeks on the island. Access is by boat, obviously. Um, and the jetty is here and it can only access at high tide. So it's a bit limited about uh, we have to time our visits quite carefully. But the idea is to put 50 new queens each two weeks. Uh, that's 10 from each of the five departments. And we'll see how it works. We're going to have to feed the bees uh, both sugar and protein because there's not much in the way of flowers on the island. Uh, we're carrying out an environmental impact study just to make sure what other insects there are all in the island and make sure we don't um, exterminate them with the presence of too many bees on the island. In Normandy, these are very rough statistics because uh, Norm Normans are renowned for uh, being very unforthcoming about how they earn their money and everything. So these are these are guesses. But we think there are 15 professional breeders of black bees within Normandy. Uh, we and our group control some 1,500 hives within the five conservation zones. Obviously, there are a lot more hives than that, but these are the ones that we actually control and can ensure that they are actually black bees. And then there are uh, we do up to 2,000 virgin queens over the whole of Normandy each year and some 400 new colonies. These are all distributed to our own members. They're not for sale to the public. We don't make money out of the operation. And then there's a new federation created at a Normandy regional level um, last year, the end of last year, called Rast de Normandy. And this was set up by the regional government um, to protect, we have 25 breeds unique to Normandy. Um, and this federation, generously funded by the region, uh, was set up to protect and promote those uh, 25. There's some of them represented here. We've got three breeds of sheep, etc. But they're the black bee to Normandy. It's a bit cheeky because the black bee isn't unique to Normandy, but we're calling it that anyway. And um, so they're protected as well. And we get to, we've got, they've just for this year, they've given a huge grant to a, a DNA analysis uh, laboratory who's going to help us identify not just bees, but in other breeds as well, identify um, our, our, and the uniqueness of our breeds. The, the regional government have produced uh, postcards as well and posters and uh, lots of, of communication material to do with these, with these breeds, including the black bee. I'll come down to really the last the last bit of my presentation now. I'll come down to a very local project in Livero. Livero is down here. That's where I live. That's the capital of our department. This is the Calvados department, and this is Livero. Uh, you can see it's quite low lying. I'm I'm actually seventy five meters above sea level. Um, uh, that is how the map looks around us. It's made up of quite a lot of little villages. Livero itself has a population of two and a half thousand people. The whole um, Livero Pédoge, the whole community, um, has about 6,000 inhabitants, so it's not, not a vast population. And that's how it looks. That's my valley early in the morning in October. Um, it's very typical. We get a mist in the morning. I try and keep my hives up a bit um, 
uh, out of the, the river valley because um, we have had some problems with um, what you call it stone brood um, with um, a, a fungal uh, infection of the, of the brood. So we find it better to keep them up out of the, out of the, out of the wet a bit. The town of Livero has gone mad about bees. We've got this, when you come into the north of the town on the roundabout, there's a, a big hive. It doesn't look it on this photograph, but it's nearly six feet tall. Um, they've joined a national uh, scheme run by the National Beekeepers Union called Apicite, and it's an award given to towns that make an effort for bees and other pollinators. Um, and they're very proud of that. That's the scheme. We've got um, a cheese factory in the town called Grand Orge. And they are now my local major sponsor. This is their visitor center on the front of their factory. They receive 50,000 visitors a year. And we do um, talks in there to talk to the visitors about the black bee. And, and uh, I have beyond the factory, you can't really see it there, but I have 10 hives in the field next to us. And they sell my honey in their shop uh, and everything. That's one of the posters, um, the signs made by the regional government to promote the black bee. And this was at the opening ceremony for the uh, for the project with, with Grand Orge. ANC is my local beekeepers union. And so uh, the Grand Orge produces special cheese, <coughs> a Livero cheese, with a, a label on it to do with the black bee uh, conservation project. And for every cheese they sell, they give us 20 cents, uh, 20 cents teams to, towards the Black Bree project. In return, I put their own label on my honey <coughs> and that's for sale in their shop. Now, selection work. Every autumn, September and October, I take samples from all my hives. It's got a lot of work, but I take some 40 bees and put them in pure alcohol so I can work on them over the winter. I get a lot of samples, not just from my own highs, but from other people's as well. I set up for each sample, I take a wing, 32 wings from each sample, right hand wings, and I put them on a glass slide and put them in a high resolution scanner. And that's 16 of them. Um, so that's how they look. I then use a German software called Flugel Index to measure what we talked about before, the cubital index, and the discoidal shift on all the wings. There it is, that's the screen I have when I'm working on the wings. And I put on each wing eight reference points. And according to those eight reference points, you get a value uh, for the wing. Cubital index on this particular wing was 1.66, and the discoidal shift was minus 0.4, which is perfect. This colony on the hand was polluted, and you'll see values of over two for cubital index. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So this, this colony is polluted and I wouldn't use it for breeding purposes, but it shows you, it's a lot of work. It, um, I'm, I put thousands and thousands of reference points on thousands of wings every winter. I do three or four colonies a day because it drives me potty otherwise. Uh, the software produces a graph like this. Everything that's in a blue cross in this quarter of the graph is good. It shows it's a black bee negative discoidal shift and a cubital index value of less than two. If the colony is polluted, it shows up straight away as red crosses. <clears throat> right hand side is over two, the value of the, and over zero for the discoidal shift. That colony needs to be requeened rapidly before it starts polluting everything around it. The best colonies, the purest ones, I send off for DNA analysis and I get this sort of figure back uh, not, it tells me what haplotype I'm dealing with and the level of genetic introgression I'm likely to get. These colonies are interesting because they have only 5% or no percent um, pollution, and I can use them safely for producing males and for making, uh, making new queens. For males, I've set up a, a frame like this, um, worker foundation on the top half and male foundation on the bottom half. And I put these uh, into the selected hives mid-March. So next week or so, if it's warm enough, I'll do it. Within a few days, they start drawing out the comb. Within a week, uh, it's pretty much drawn out. And the, I can't show you on this photograph, but there is actually, the queen is actually all laid eggs in <coughs> a lot of the brood. When it's finished and everything's capped, you get this. You've got worker brood on top, male brood on the bottom. 
and I take it out of the hive and give them a new frame to work on. And this frame, the male frame, I take to a, a male bank where you can see I've got one, two, three, four, five frames from five different um, stocks. Um, it's an orphan colony. The uh, workers emerge first, followed by the males. The workers are young bees, they need work to do. So I give them another frame of uh, foundation to work on, otherwise they, they, they get bored. But their, their role is mainly to feed the, the um, feed the males, keep honey coming in, nectar coming in to feed the males all through the season. As soon as all the males have emerged from a frame, I take it out and bring the new one and a new one in. So I've got two frames for each brood stock, um, so I can keep a constant supply of males all through the year. That worked fine last year until a point in June where everything dried up and there wasn't nectar coming in and the population of males decline very rapidly. They need nectar flow all the time, the, the males. I won't go on too much about raising queens because John's going to talk about that, but I, I raise 20 or 30 queens a week, as I said earlier on. My union, however, we raise um, 100 or, or so each week um, and distribute them at very low price, for, um, eight euros to our members. Um, I have a little incubator which I that's the week's um, grafting uh, um, I use orphan colonies to raise the cells and I put them into my incubator and I let my queens emerge in the incubator I mark them with a numbered disc and then I use a system I don't know if you've come across this in the states that it's made by Nico um, they're re-emergent cells it's a plastic tube with an open end um, it has a, a breather hole in the cap and we make wax caps um, to imitate a, a royal cell. So my new queen comes out, she's numbered. I put her head first into the tube and close it and then place it in the orphan hive uh, where she can emerge. This hive I orphaned a week or so before. I put a, a bee boost in there to hold the colony from uh, producing new queens. And then as soon as I put the new queen in, I'll take that away and hopefully she's accepted. It's a pretty good system. We've got near, pretty much near, near 100% acceptance rate. Bee, black bees are reputed not to accept new queens very well, but the, the system works very well. Out of focus picture of my mating apiary, where I this particular lot was um, six frame nukes uh, creating new colonies, but I also use um, mini, plus, mini plus hives there, six quarter frames, uh, which is great when you just want the queen and not trying to produce a new colony. They're in the shelter of trees. There's plenty of um, uh, reference points for the new queens to see where they're coming back. Out in front here, there's a, a flower meadow and my two male banks are one over to the right and one to the extreme left. So my new queens come out and they can't help meeting my boys um, on their way out. And that's it. Thank you. That was great, Roderick. Thank you so much. And I really appreciate actually um, you setting the stage and giving us some of that history because I think, um, you know, I can't speak for all Americans, but we, you know, many of us when we get into beekeeping initially, I know for me when I got started in beekeeping 27 years ago that, um, yeah, I had no idea how how massive <laughs> this type of um, you know, enterprise really was at least just all the multifacets that um, are a part of apiculture and beekeeping and how regional it can be, but yet also how universal um, and many parallel, you know, sorts of um, uh, uh, not only approaches, but reviews and interests and um, research queries that are out there. A lot of us want to learn more about the bees mm. and the bees that we have and where they come from. I've definitely, we were chatting about this right before we logged on too, about, yeah. um, uh, you know, just the that interplay between environment and genetics and how you get this phenotypic or these more land race or ecotypical um, mm. uh, expressions, you know, the behavior and the and how that even affects the physiology. I actually did not know that the wing venation was very distinct. Yeah, very much that. so. Yeah. I did not know that. So it's, not, it's nothing it, like yeah. any any other bee. Wow, 
that is super cool to learn. Um, yeah, identifying the good colonies. Right. And you've got some lovely um, comments in the chat. And I know that um, okay, John is here with us, but I want to, there's a few questions and then we can do a, a bio break for those who um, need one or would like to stretch their legs if you haven't okay. done so already. But I'm going to go ahead and ask you a few questions here that are in the chat and then um, we okay. may move over to, to John and then if there's any left, uh, you can answer them as well. The other thing too is some of these questions may actually um, really have a oh, I won't say have, but really could be directed to both of you. So yeah, sure. I may save some for towards the okay. end if you're able to stay with us through the entirety. Um, okay. So here's one, one question from Anthony too. In the U.S., there are numerous and extensive queen rearing efforts to develop bees that can deal with Varroa mites. In other parts of the world or in your part of the world, do you have the same efforts in yes. um, queen rearing and what success? Yes, um, there is an, uh, an organization, I think you've probably heard of it, called Arista Bee. Um, they're working out of Belgium and they've done a lot of work on selection of, of bees, particularly buckfast bees. Um, they're is trying to isolate the genes which make the bees uh, resistant to veromites. They've had quite a lot of success with that. We haven't done anything of the sort with uh, with black bee, except that I do what's called the pin test, where I puncture um, 50 cells or 100 cells and then go back after a few hours to see how they're reacting. Apparently, that pin test is really pertinent for checking on the colony's ability to deal with varroa mites because it imitates the damage that a varroa mite does to the, the larva, the pupa inside the cell. Um, I use freeze tests, freeze kill tests for uh, general hygiene behavior, getting rid of dead cell, dead larva and so on. But, but yeah, um, the, the answer is yes, there is a lot of work going on to um, finding bees that are resistant to varroa mites. Yeah. Right. And it's, um, you know, the bees themselves are on a lifelong quest to become <laughs> resistant, whether we intervene yeah. or not. You know? Yeah, <laughs> there, there are some there are some people who claim to not treat their, their bees for, for years. I'm very skeptical about that. Um, I think if you don't treat your bees, I know it depends on the techniques you use. But if you don't treat your bees and you just leave them in the same place and you don't uh, it's, do anything about the varroa mites, the chances are your colony will be dead within two years. Some bees right. can tell some Right, and I, I've sort of evolved my, my practice and even thinking about that too, because, you know, now we're finding just more, um, how much more virulent, you know, mm. their vector, their vectoring process is. And so, mm. you know, what, even if you just have one mite, the chances of those sort of side effects of virus loads can, um, exponentially oh, yeah. be magnified and so you know yeah. but i walk a fine line between treatment supplementing and therapy I, for some reason i like the word therapy and supplement better than treatment but you know a lot of it really does rest still in genetic selection you know and that's yeah. a part of that um and that's where that man overall. man can help we, we, we can help mm -hmm. the bee uh, if you yeah. left their own devices bees will develop uh, colonies that are resistant to varroa mites, but they tend to end up being quite small, swarmy colonies. They deal with the varroa mite by, by moving house uh, and, right. leaving, and move, right. leaving their brood behind. And uh, that's one tactic. But, um, yeah, we see that with Scutellata for sure. You know. Yeah. Um, so here's another question. This is from Tim. Um, how do you increase the concentration? Well, and actually you did answer this, but I was just going to re uh, ask this no. question. So maybe you could reiterate. So how do you increase the concentration of um, Apismiferum militia genes in the land race when there are other subspecies in abundance in the local mongrel bees? And, and this connects actually to um, uh, Chairwick Sean's uh, uh, question here. In your opinion, how large of an apiary buffer would be required to keep the pollution to a minimum. So can you go over the, the sure. sort of buffer? Um, that, that answers both, I think. We, we have found, and it's generally accepted in France, that a three kilometer pure zone um, is good for a mating area. Um, and within that, we, we produce new virgin queens and distribute them in the larger 10 kilometer area. All those virgin queens, however badly they're mated, will always make black males. That's a very important fact because they're, they're laying unfertilized eggs to make males. It's only the genes of the queen that are passed on. 
So we give away almost our virgin queen, the black queens, to encourage people to put them into their hives and make have clouds and clouds of black males floating around. It's the only tactic is saturation. And when you're talking about a landlocked um, conservation zone, um, we are going to benefit from the island side. Of course, it's a totally different concept. But um, but yes, it's it's very important to produce tons of of good virgin queens and distribute them largely within a 10 kilometer from the central point, a 10 kilometer radius circle to make sure that the, the maximum number of males are floating around. Yeah, thank you so much, Roderick. There's a few questions in the chat, which um, maybe you'd like to take the time to kind of answer your own perspective. And there's there's actually been some in there that I want to save to also share to both of you at the end. Mm -hmm. But um, why don't we go ahead and um, take a little five minute bio break and then we'll we'll bring John on, um, which John is doing double duty. He's also at another conference and meeting and, and um, is uh, slipping us into his busy schedule. So so very thank you to um, very much gratitude. Sorry, I'm twisting my words up here to um, to John. And thank you so much, Roderick. This is really, really fascinating. And I, I don't want you to leave yet because I know that there's going to be some more questions and discussions at the end. Well, I, I'm going to get something warm because I'm cold here. <laughs> there you go. Yes, we'll do, we'll do our little bio break. So okay. um, thank you, everybody. Um, go ahead and take a little five minute break. Okay, we'll be back in a second. Because, yeah, I think okay. we're, we're right at time. So go right ahead. All right. Uh, well, thank you very much for asking me to talk. Um, I should have, my head should be full of plenty of information anyway after this weekend. So, yeah. Well, uh, and you know what, John? Sorry to interrupt you. I can read your um, introductory bio if you'd like. Yeah, you can. Yeah, okay. Okay, so I'll just share that this is John Thorpe. <laughs> He's our second presenter in today's um, March 2023 uh, WASP Minicon. So he is the PRO or PRO, which you can tell me what that means for the uh, um, public relations officer. There we go. Public relations officer for the Native Irish Honey Society in Ireland. He's also the librarian and a committee member of Fingal North Dublin Beekeepers Association, which is a member of the Federation of Irish Beekeepers Association or FIBKA. He started keeping bees about 17 years ago. He's in the last area in Europe that has the native black bee, Apis mellifera mellifera, left in abundance as most of Europe has been crossbred with many other races, Carniolan, Buckfast, etc. They set up and organized conservation areas where people pledge to keep only the native Irish black honeybee and have been running queen bee rearing courses for the last two years and are into week five of year three now. Uh, he didn't necessarily have a great start in beekeeping and was about to give up until he went to visit a Native Irish Honeybee Society open day on an apiary owned by John Somerville in Tullamore, County Offlay, where he was amazed at his bees and his medals and many, many prizes from honey shows. And he's gone on to win one or two since. So awesome. Thank you, John, so much for joining us today. Thank you. I'm very pleased to be here. Um, I'm not too sure, uh, obviously, on the time difference. Is it eight o'clock in the morning there, or what sort of time are you at, or are you all at different times? Actually, now we're at 11, 18 mountain time, but tomorrow oh. the time zone changes. We'll go now, an is hour that ahead. Most, yeah. Is that most people looking at this? Um, I think so, but we do have folks okay. who are coming in from different areas, so yeah. it's a little okay, bit Okay, well, spread. that's good. So everyone's kind of awake at this stage. Yes, we're wide yeah. awake. <laughs> okay, so, um, yeah, I'm John Tharp. I'm the Public Relations Officer for NIMS. So basically, I do a monthly newsletter and try and get in touch with the press and different things on what we're trying to do. Um, it is a PowerPoint slide I'm using, hopefully, is don't all die or fall asleep. So apologies for that. Um, we were established in 2012 uh, to support the native, basic, the various strains of the native Irish honeybee. Um, so we were just members of FIBCA, which is the Federation of Irish Beekeepers Associations. They wouldn't support the native Irish honeybee like we wanted to. 
as an organization. So we broke away and formed NIBS. Now we didn't, I'm still a member of FIBCA, so we're not a beekeeping association that you can join and get bee insurance with and all of that. We're just trying to protect the native Irish honeybee. So, which in Latin is Apis mellifera mellifera. So you have Apis mellifera, various other names for the other bees as well. Um, yeah, sorry, I thought I skipped one there. So a cross bar organization. So basically what that means we do, so there's Ireland, the Republic of Ireland is 26 counties and then the six counties in Northern Ireland, which is, if you were to remove the sea, it's part of the United Kingdom. So you have Wales, England, Scotland and Northern Ireland, but we cover Northern Ireland. So we're not a political thing that once you go over the border, you can't be a nibs. Whereas Fibka, would stop at the border and the Ulster Beekeepers Association then would start on the other side of the border. But we're, the, the conference I'm at today, there's probably 30% of the people down here from Northern Ireland. So we truly are an All-Ireland organization, you know. Um, this is our book. It took us about 10 years to get it all together. Um, if you are trying to protect bees or do anything in that line, uh, doing something like this is, is amazing. We put all our leaflets into it and people from all over the years um, contrib contributed to it. it. It's absolutely fantastic. Uh, you'll see Thomas D. Seeley did the forward there. It, my head's kind of covering a bit of the stuff here, so I don't, I'm assuming you can see full screen. Um, so our aims are to, to promote the conservation and improvement of native Irish honeybees, to establish conservation areas around the island, um, to promote the formation of bee improvement groups. I'll kind of come back to that better in a minute and to provide education on bee improvement. So basically that's to inform people what the native Irish honeybee is rather than like a lot of people just think wasps are bees, you know, they just see a stripy flying thing. So we actively try and um, educate. Well, my big thing is to educate children and the public. Some people are trying to educate beekeepers more on what the black bee is. I am of the opinion we need to really educate the public more so that they will then ask a beekeeper who's selling honey are they native Irish honeybees? And then that should follow on for him to go find out. Geez, I wonder are they? So we act in an advisory capacity to groups who wish to promote Apis mellifera, so mellifera, mellifera. So we'll, we'll do everything we can, um, provide funding, uh, education and everything. Um, so the other groups, an organization we work with FIBCA, the Federation of Irish Beekeepers. IBA is a FIB, a few people in FIBCA had a row. They formed the Irish Bee Association. Uh, so now we have two groups within Ireland, which unfortunately means, you know, there's a bit, bit more of a split up. Uh, but anyway, that happened. Um, uh, sorry. The other thing is NUIG. Sorry about all these little acronyms. Um, that's the National University of Galway. And also we work very closely with Ulster. So last night there was eight to 10 professors here and not just from Galway and Ulster, but actually I think there was six here from Cork. So they come down here to um, see what we're all talking about. And they run, NUIG run a huge DNA and um, morphometry um, the whole lot uh, analysis of our bees. They're doing a big one at the moment. Just to, there was a reagent that they made a mess of, and uh, we've had to do all the sampling again. But these things happen. But we're, we're really trying to do a huge uh, survey at the moment, not just to prove we have black bees here, but just to, to prove that uh, inbred bees coming in and non-natives are affecting them. Um, 
sorry, I have done things like this just to hopefully wake people up. Um, so this is Drumroll Honey. As part as a member of Fibka, you or the Nibs, you get this sticker and you can put it on your honey and it says it was produced by Native Irish Honey Bees. And it's kind of to encourage beekeepers to keep Native Irish Honey Bees and also a bit of advertisement for us. Again, that mammy's children, daddies will be saying, oh great, they're the Native Irish Honey Bees, I'll buy them. Um, we attend, I can't actually read that bit at the top because my thing's covering it, but we attend various shows. So this is the Trim Mead show. We did an observation hive here. This is the, this man's called the Cahir. Like he'd be like a congressman in America. And that's me giving out stickers. So kids come up and see the queen and uh, we give them out stickers. This man has a huge bee sticking me. That's the little table I had. Um, we do this thing where we have a 2D uh, barcode. So people can just go up with the, Can you see my mouse moving? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so they can scan that with their phone. It'll get them straight through to our website. And the other one here then, that'll get them straight through to Facebook. And these are our conservation signs. It's just like one of our stands. So just trying to get publicity. So we brought in a thing called the protection of the native Irish honey bee. What so much screen am I on yet? Grand. I'm sorry, I'm just seeing how many slides I've gone through. So we had amazing success with a thing called the protection of the native Irish honey bee. And it is a bill, I don't know what it would be called in the Senate or the Congress, but basically it's to change the law so that um, no bees can be imported. So, uh, sorry, non-native uh, uh, honeybees. So like Carnioleans, Buckfasts and everything. It is done in places, Collins A, the Isle of Man. You bring anything into the Isle of Man, even a jar of honey or a stick with a bit of honey on it, Five thousand pound and probably jail. They've no disease that I know of. They don't have varroa mites and they don't want to get them. They've great bees there. Anyway, we were ten years, we were about ten years working on trying to get this change of law. And in the last two years, we've really done well. We've got to a thing called the fourth stage. You now there's ten stages. First and second stage was really hard. We've got through to the fourth stage. They now want independent scientific proof that uh, non-native bees will affect the native bee. So we have to come up with that. They announced that on the 9th of this month. I don't know what it is now. And they want the tender in by the 31st, which is really trying to kind of kick the legs from under us, you know, because they want this huge, uh, scientific project all uh, prepared and tendered for, but in like 22 days or 30 days, whatever, which is ridiculous, but we are going to have to try and do something with it. So this is us outside what might be Congress or the, you know, this is our parliament. So this is Senator Vincent Martin. He's the one who proposed and brought this through. This is Kleena Kimber. She is a senior councillor, probably one of the most senior barristers in Ireland. And she freely, and you probably know how much barristers charge, did, and her team did huge work on all the legal side of this, as in, can we legally stop bees coming in? Will it affect free trade for Europe? All of that stuff. And this man, uh, He's barrister and a senator as well. Uh, he's the one who introduced it and hasn't got it to say for. So we had this protest outside the, the government buildings. It wasn't a protest. Uh, sorry, it was a demonstration, but for the bill, not a protest against it. You know the way most people protest against things. So this was for it. Um, this Loretta Neary, are, she's now our chairman, and this is Colm O'Neill. He's in charge of all our Queen Marine and everything. And these are the police here behind. We didn't throw any. Actually, I got a smoker going. That uh, got on the news. Uh, so that's one of our ex chairman He would have been one of the really, really strong founder members. He's here today uh, of the Native Irish Honey Bee Society. Again, this is Leinster House, and we've signed here. Save Native, native Irish Honey Bee. Now, I'm new to all of this kind of how to get publicity and get on the news. So not this girl, but another man 
he's in my beekeeping association he brought his granddaughter dressed as a bee with wings and the new the cameras just all started taking the covers off and bang now i do get advice from a publicity guy i look after i help him with his bees and he gives me advice and he says bring a puppy the next time as well so small cute small cute children and puppies forget about your signs and your bee suits a smoker small children and a puppy you'll get on the tv which is what we wanted and we wanted newspaper coverage as well uh so if carlsberg did i don't know if you have this saying uh so there's a saying here like if carlsberg did you know made cars they'd be ferraris type of thing but basically Carls did political, Carlsberg did political debates. This would be one. The bill reading was unprecedented in this country with cross party support across every single party. Now that means every single party in the country, none excluded, spoke for our bill. Every single one. Uh, never done before. Absolutely amazing. And we have one uh, senator who is in Senator Vincent P. Martins, in his Green Party, who's given us all our hassle and blocking us the whole way. Only one, but she happens to be the Minister of Agriculture. And she sits with him in government chatting and then goes into the chamber and, and, and slates him and says she wants scientific advice and all this. We think she's scared of people in the Department of Environment and they're putting her under pressure. Sorry, that was my alarm. So in the last year, um, we just basically had an amazing year. Um, the amount of people that came on board with us, sorry, I'm just kind of synopsizing that here, uh, was brilliant. Um, we've gone from maybe 200 members to about 1,500 now. We've had 180 people here today to the conference. We had 100 last night. We'd 111 at the AGM. Now, AGMs are boring. It's just the election of officers and things. We 24 at our last few Zoom ones. Now, that was Zoom as well, but it means more and more beekeepers are coming on board and learning about the black bee and, you know, trying to help. Um, sorry, that appeared to... My head is just blocking this bit, sorry. Now, we've, for the last two or three years, we've been doing queen rearing workshops and having a thing called uh, queen rearing and APRE open days. We used to have two or three. I have to move that thing again. Oh. Sorry, I'm blocking myself here on seeing stuff. So, uh, we hope to have at least six other areas hoping, uh, hosting Queen Rearing Days and Native Irish Honey Bee Open Days next year. Um, I think we might get 12, which would be absolutely fantastic. Uh, so basically what we do on them is people come and travel and we show them the practical side, open a hive, show them how to do grafting, show them how gender kits work. Uh, show, I don't know if you use apodeas or three frame nukes but we show them all of that and um the, the with covid and everything we couldn't and thankfully it's all you know gotten changed now and people are starting to do it so for those of you who don't know why we're trying to um i'll probably go over stuff roderick said here but who don't know why we're trying to promote the native irish honeybee it's not aggressive it won't follow you. If it does, you need to requeen your hive. And it shouldn't attack you as you walk back to your car. And similarly, it shouldn't attack you as you walk from your car to your hives. Um, I just put this in. Uh, it's a huge thing that comes up. People say, why is a native Irish honeybee? Uh, probably most of you know who are here uh, what the difference is but basically we're looking for dark abdomens here and not yellow banding now some of the dna testing things i've just been down to uh, they would 
class a tiny yellow spot here as you know it's not native it's got a bit of crossbreeding uh, they would class this as definitely you know a carny maybe not so much a curly onion but uh you know it's got a bit of buck faster crossbreeding in it um because carny oleans can actually look like this as well sometimes but through the dna testing we've just been doing recently which the, I was actually talking to the professor today. She's going to go back and redo it again. Um, so some people, you know, the first thing you look at is the color of the bee, the size of the bee, you know, is it small or big? Then they start looking at wing morphometry and everything. They have done DNA tests on bees with yellow banding that are like 98% AMM, and they've done tests on these bees, which are black, that aren't. So you can have a bee that's kind of looks like a native Irish black bee or native Irish Normandy bee or whatever it happens to be. And it mightn't actually, you know, DNA-wise have the, the strains it should have. But as I say, they're... they're um, they're readdressing that in case they've made a mistake before they tell anybody. So this is our queen rearing. That's this picture of a queen. So what we did with, we set up a queen rearing thing. So we established groups of 10 or more. So this was within a different associations. Um, we got stocks of native Irish honeybees from our sort of best APBs. Uh, Galway bee, uh, uh, queen wearing group would be one of them. So they gathered together, say, 50 nukes, and we distributed them all around the country. So these queen wearing groups use these already proven, you know, native Irish honeybees that are, you know, well behaved, uh, you know, top of the range, you know, the best of the best, and breed off them and then carry on from that, see how you go. And then obviously the, the thing is after two years, then they, they give us one back and we give that to another uh, queen rearing guru who's setting up. Um, the big thing was a lot of people were would have four hives. They lose two queens and they're ringing up. Has anyone got queens? No. All oh, right, what do I do? Do I just let me queens die? So we had a big shortage of queens. Excuse me. So people would just buy, oh, there's a book fast for sale for 30, which that'll keep me hive going. And I don't blame them. I know, you know, especially if you haven't got many hives, you don't want to just let them die. So our whole thing on this was to take the black hour out of queen rearing and let people learn how to do it within their association. Now we said 10, we know only four people will probably, you know, turn up every week and do it. But once they produce the queens and then the next year they can teach more people and you get all these groups going like my association, we this is just our third year doing it. We've got three spin-offs already. So we're supplying three nukes to them. Now they're all members of my beekeeping association, which is Fingal. But now we've got like 40 people you know, from that, you know, but they have three little groups, but that's the way to do it. And then those three groups, hopefully, will turn into nine. And so the idea is especially not just to provide queens, but hopefully to flood the place with drones, as Roderick was saying as well, you know. Um, so this was kind of the rule, produce two mated queens per person, try and double it. Um, you have to give feedback uh, and increase production. They were just kind of the rules. Uh, that's just quite a nice picture of bees. Uh, it's funny, if any is involved in social media, that got 58,000 views on Facebook. I put up an, another picture with the same information and I got 362 views. So sometimes if you're trying to get a message across, pick your picture well. Now, I don't know how, what the trick is. I think that's quite a nice picture, but I put a very similar one up again with, again, the same information. 
and I got about 3,000 views. So it might be just the day, I don't know. So this is a big thing we do, which is April open days and, and one of the secrets we have. So this is Jerry Kine again. Uh, he's from Connemara out in Galway. So he's standing here in this field. Now, oh, there's five of these areas. So he's showing, I think he's probably doing uh, how he does his double brew box and stuff. So each person is kind of expert and a groups of 10 people now, we could have 50 or 100 people at it, but small groups go to this area and stand there, say, for half an hour, 40 minutes, and he goes through the whole process of what he does here, and then they move on to the next stand. And that's how we do our Queen op our April Open Days for Queen Mary. Hands-on. And people can grab hold of the frames. He'll show them what to do. You know, it, it's all hands-on. Because all our Queen Rearing lectures are all zoom online with the uh, powerpoint screens and everything so this is just again this is john somerville inspecting so he's put his queen cups on here his bees have drawn out the queen cells as you probably know uh, some people do this they use tea tails uh, you know to keep them warm we're using it because um this hive would have been repeatedly open and closed all day for the uh, open day, you know, because there'd be, say, 10 lots of 10 people viewing. So you don't want the hive just open all day. Um, these bees, you can just, you can just want, wave your hand over the top of this hive barehanded. I only put gloves on it in this apiary to, for hygiene. The bee, the, this man's bees don't sting you. And he doesn't have a wasp problem. So this is just a, a sample of Chinese grafting tool. We we also use brushes. Um, that's a good egg taken out. Again, loads of grafting tools. One of the tricks the guys use when they get them, they actually kind of scrape down the end here because they found they'd be kind of bristly just to even smooth it off a bit more. And this is just where they're, they're doing the grafting. Again, this is another table. People all come over and they all got a chance to graft. So again, this is John Somerville here. Uh, I don't know if I have the picture. What we do is sometimes we inspect all the cells and where you see the good, uh, as you'll know, it has to be a certain age, the egg. We'll actually put like a blue, I think that might be a blue pen. We'll put a blue pen around the hexag hexagonal shape of the top of the cell where it's a good egg. You can't see it there. So then when you actually go to do it, you just go into all them blue holes and you, you know they're all good cells. So this is John just again showing people. Now this is another, you know, another table you go to. He's showing people, you can see all the bees hanging off here. Now he's going through looking for good or bad queen cells. And you may see him in a minute saying dud, dud, dud and things. It should play. Sorry. Yeah. So did you just get that? Yeah. Yeah, we could see it. Now, <clears throat> what he's doing, he's going good, meaning that's a bad one, good one, bad one, good one. And you might hear them say nine out of 20. He's probably one of the best beekeepers in the whole country. He, his house is just stuffed with trophies for honey, wax, candles. I just thought he was great at entering honey shows till I, I seen his bees. It all starts with your bees. I'll just let you see again. Now, 
You know, that bee's on my hand. I've no gloves on there. No, he's only wearing gloves because we're having an AP open day. And it's, you know, it's for hygiene and he doesn't want anyone's diseases getting into his thing. But I was just holding, it wasn't even a camera, it was just my phone. But there, his bees just land on my hand and have a walk around and walk away. Amazing bees. Uh, that's just him again, sorry. No, he does brilliant things. Uh, he probably has some sort of invention here with a piece of wood. He does a great one where he has a thing marked out here on a new box. And he puts an happy day down. He has little wooden slots and I said to him what's that for and he puts the apodeia down he pulls the floor out puts the roof back on and he just leaves it there for a few days and all the bees will just make their way down into the new and if they don't want to they can come back in for a little warm or come back down and then he says eventually he just takes the apodeia off and your apodeia is in the nuke no hassle so this is apodeia training um again this is another stand so this man is expert at padayas and he's showing everyone how to use them um this is our gender we use nikosh and gender we show both um so again you now that's column o'neill there this is say stand three you can see here in the background there's another one so it's a big huge green field um this here we're using the side of the of a van with an a2 laminate sheet it's just showing blown up frame pictures so you can kind of examine i don't know chart brew different diseases and stuff this is probably a disease table showing people different ones um i just took this because i thought it was brilliant uh his bees are just this man's bee. you can rub your hand barehanded right across that all day the bees won't go near you absolutely brilliant sorry for going on about them so this is just another stand here. Again, that's, so I think that says, I can't read that, I don't have been reading the letters on. Anyway, that's stand five or whatever. So then the big thing, you want tea and sandwiches at the end. So this is John Somerville's family. This is an ammo box, which we found great for putting your smoker in when you're finished. Um, just a little thing if you want to get one. Um, this is the group that were there on that particular day. And try and do that at the start of the day if you have an open day's rent, because it, it's impossible to get everyone together at the end of the day. And then you don't have a memory of the day, you know. So we invite beekeeping suppliers to it. So this is bee supplies. Um, we had four beekeeper suppliers here at the conference, but we'd only invite one to the open to the pre open days. Um, so that's my chairman, this Liam Rice. He's next year. That's John Somerville. Now, that's the fella who was going duds. That's his apiary. He has two hearing aids. He was involved in a massive explosion in a mine. He worked shifts. He worked very long hours. And he still, he, this was in England. He worked there. And he still became a very, very successful beekeeper there. He learned his beekeeping in England and then came back home. But he doesn't have a real handy job where he finishes at two o'clock or anything, and he's still able to raise bees. Uh, this is our conservation area sign. This is the new thing we've done. Again, we've got a 2D barcode here. Um, these go up, so I don't know, let's say the White House. Oh yeah, we've got a, we want to be a conservation area for bees. So they get to put one of these up on our gate. They don't necessarily have to have a beehive, but it means they want to bring in non-native non bees into the area. Now, I'm not saying a non-native bee might land on the bush, but they won't deliberately do it. I'm just making sure I didn't skip anything there. Um, so it's really become a big thing for us now. Uh, now, I was doing up sort of small plastic signs at the start, and a few people got on board with me and uh, said, right, we'll do this. We'll, you know, we'll help you do it properly. So it's for the protection and growth of, of growth of Apis mellifera mellifera populations in the designated uh, conservation areas. It's a key element of the strategy of NIB. So we've got the conservation areas, the queen rearing, and then this bill we're trying to push through as well. 
So it's aimed at beekeeping associations, farmers, food companies, anyone basically who has a bit of land or anything at all that will stick up a sign and sign up to the to the agreement we have. It's not legal or anything. Uh, you know, we're not going to bring them to court if, you know, we found other bees. No, sorry, if we found Buckfast beehives, there are signs would be coming down. But no, it's not. It's it, it's more publicity. The people try buying their cars and go, oh, look, they've got native, native Irish honeybees. Again, it's kind of PR, you know. Um, I don't think you need to know that bit. Uh, so, yeah, one of the, as you know, because bees may out in the open, um, that's what's causing hybridization with us. So the members of the CAs undertake to keep only native Irish only bees. So hopefully we only have um, dark drones uh, mating, even if there is a book fast queen, hopefully the dark bee drones mate with it and then her offspring will start getting darker and darker. Um, you do know about the monk who figured out how the queen mates, I presume. Yeah. Yeah, to a okay. certain degree. <laughs> um, yeah, well, most, most people thought the queen mated in the hive and this blind monk, um, he had astute hearing and he could he could actually hear that he knew when the queens were flying. Uh, so he'd say, oh, there's a queen. And then he'd say, oh, there she is back again. And they started catching them. So they go, oh, yeah, she's not mated. But then when they caught them coming back, they'd see she was mated. They're going, how'd they do that? Anyway. That was a long time ago. So this is one of our big conservation areas in Kerry. So they're all holding up the sign here to show it off, which is what we want them to do. Very, very hard to get them to just send me one picture with the sign, but that's what the signs look like. And we do them in Irish as well, especially with places like Kerry. Um, so that's the Irish sign there. So this is a guy signing up to a native Irish conservation area. Now we also had a show there. That was where the guy was holding the big B to my head. And this is our secretary. And this guy runs Johnstown Castle, which is a beautiful place. Uh, that's me with my bees. Uh, they're actually in my hand there. They are flying in and out there. All I wanted to do was get a picture of this sign on the hive. And I don't know what I've been messing around. I had a little bit of honey in my hands anyway. And they started rooting around and having a, a, a snack. And this took me a little while because I said, this is not make a great photograph. I tried to do it myself. It's very hard to take a photograph of yourself holding bees in your hand with a phone. So I rang my daughter up and she drove two kilometers up the road and took those pictures. But that would have been maybe 15 or 20 minutes into me putting that sign there. So that's how long they didn't sting me with my veil down and my gloves off. Um, so it's just to show what, no, it was a nice day. You know, I don't think a chance in the winter, but um, that's the type of bees we're trying to raise. Can you see, is that a video? Yeah. Can you see a video playing there? Yes, sorry, I couldn't yeah, get my so, cursor to click. <laughs> apologies, so a guy in Tyrone did this. It's just a nice video uh, of native Irish honeybees. Um, I just thought it was very, very nicely done. It's only a couple of minutes long. Now, I was lynched at a meeting here <coughs> where I was told, that queen's not a native Irish honeybee, it's got yellow stripes, you know, here. So <coughs> it isn't. And that's why we put this in, importations of foreign 
warm climate bees is it's throwing the black bee gene pool. And that's why we showed one of those bees. But the lady who actually screamed at me, the man who made the video was there at the same time. And he said, well, just what I've told you, well, we put that in onto the video to show what a non-native queen is. And he said, by the way, I filmed that in your apiary. So she didn't say anything after that. Now, I love that little video and I'm begging that guy for three years to do me another one. Uh, I'm coming up, I think, on my third lot of 15 minutes. So I just put this in if anyone started asking me questions I didn't know the answers to. So um, I was talking about the bill we're putting through. So all these people... They all spoke in favour of our bill. You can see there's quite a lot of them. I've kind of miniaturised them there. And they're all from different parties. They're from Fianna Fáil, Fianna Gael, Sinn Féin, Independent, Labour, you name it. They're all from different uh, parties. This man here spoke three or four times for us. Um... Sorry, there's one lady I just want to show you that. So I don't know if you know who the president of Ireland is. He's called Michael D. Higgins. But this lady is Senator Alice Mary Higgins, and she is the president of Ireland's daughter. And she stood up and spoke for us. So hopefully you're not all like this now. And thank you very much. Far from it, John. That was, I'm definitely that was not okay. asleep. Sorry? <laughs> I said, far from it. I'm definitely not asleep. Oh, that's great. <laughs> <laughs> and I liked some of your little comments, you know, as you're flipping through it, <laughs> um, okay. um, which which makes it entertaining too. And I really appreciate you, um, yeah, taking the taking the time to meet with us today and sharing um, the school program that you all are working on. Yeah. And and we do have a number of questions in the chat, and so no problem. Yeah, I'll ask some of them to you and then I'll kind of ask um, some of them to both of you, to both Roderick and you to maybe uh, kind of panel between you two and share a little bit of your thoughts and your perspectives on it. So I'm kind of looking off screen at my other monitor just for the questions. Um, so this is, let's see here. Um, oh, hopefully most of them are from Roderick. <laughs> right. There we go. Well, I don't think there's any one, one single answer. Let's just put it well, that way. Well, so. I'll answer the one about the dad and tie, if you like. Sure. Can you read that one? Yeah, sure. Um, the interior height of the dad on body is 310 millimeters. That's about a foot, just over a foot. Um, so it's it's smaller. It's bigger than uh, one section of a Langstroth hive, but not as big as two. And the advantage is that the nest the, the queen lays the full depth of the frame, except for the band of pollen and honey I was talking about. Um, and the nests, without having to divide it or anything, the nest is uninterrupted uh, for the whole of the frame. I do use a system of um, div, uh, what we call divisible in French, where I use, they're like two honey supers with um, honey frames, and then I can split the colony later on. Um, but I don't use that very often. They don't, they don't like having a gap in the middle between the frames. Right. Um, well, and I'm I not mean, looking in the someone... chat at all, by the way, so I don't know what's coming up, okay? I've only got a little screen. Oh, no worries, John. I can read them to you. So, um, yeah, and it's, it was just more about the hive design, and I was going to say, you know, here's stateside. People use a variety of... of um, Designs, although of course Langstroth is the more predominant one. Um, I myself have switched to smaller, shorter frames just because of the weight. So it's a lot easier for me to lift um, mediums, what we call mediums, um, than it is to do deeps. But we actually do have a couple lands hives um, up at my farm that a neighbor made for us, a woodworker that are really pretty. And yeah, it's interesting, even when you use the deep boxes or what we call the standard deep Langstroth hives, 
I've noticed that they don't always fill out all the way through, you know, especially in that bottom box, they kind of recede up. They, they, you know, not necessarily want, um, they want a little bit of, uh, what do I want to say? Buffer space, I guess, but it really is a bridge, you know, for the longer it is, they don't have to try and cross over or build Burke home, which, you know, most people end up scraping off. So all the, all the little pros and cons, but here's a question for John. Um, and then I'll kind of go backwards because I think these questions will lead to both of you. Um, so John, what's um, the Nib's opinion on free living bees? What do you think about um, Apis mellifera mellifera that can survive in the wild without any treatments versus those that are in apiaries that seemingly can't survive without intervention? And given the work done in Galway showing they have survived just fine in the wild, Similar to um, Professor Seeley or Thomas Seeley, who's here in the States with the Arno forest bees, findings over his lifetime's work. So, yeah, in, in your opinion, what do you think about these free living wild hives and, uh, you know, that sort of comparison to the ones that are managed? This question comes up a lot. Um, it's, I just want to see what way it's worded. It's the very last one, actually. Yeah. <clears throat> so <clears throat> my opinion in it is basically the way we do it <clears throat> is we like to think that our bees are free living. So I know that by changing uh, frames for new frames and things, you are helping the bees. So we were involved with Galway in finding uh, bees in trees. Uh, we found one in a double glazed church window. And when I say double glazed, you know, it was very, very old. So there was like a three inch gap between the leaded window and the glass. So their native Irish honeybees that we're trying to protect, the ones that are in churches and the ones that are in trees, as well. Now we also have 99, I read today 106, so I, I don't know, um, other breeds of bees here. Now they're minor bees, the solitary bees, they're not honeybees, but we're also, here, our attitude is we're here to protect them, not to drive them out and just have honeybees. Um, it's a very hard question to answer, but the way we try to answer it is if you're going to keep bees, if you're going to go and buy two beehives, maybe go up to six, eight, ten over the years, we are trying to encourage people to get native Irish black bees rather than um, hybrids and to keep so to keep that native bee here. It's not that we're against what people call wild bees. It's to just encourage beekeepers to keep the native bee that has flourished here and has adapted to our weather. It's not that we don't uh, care about the what you could call wild bees in trees or church windows or whatever, especially in chimneys. We get them a lot here as well. When we do catch them, so people will want them removed from the roofs. Yes, they're put into hives. To be honest, I see it as a form of slavery sometimes. You know, you've taken them from wherever. I don't actually take a lot of honey off my bees. Um, I will rear queens and give them to people, but I don't actually sell honey. I don't do it as a living. Um, I've never made any money from selling honey. I have had a couple of good honey crops where I jarred small, not small amounts. I jarred a lot of small jars and sold them for Pieta House for charity um, and donated the money to them. So I, I don't actually, I'm not in beekeeping for money. And a lot of the people in our association are the same. They just want to look after bees. You know, it's it's not a, a question of... Um, you know, trying to catch wild swarms and lash them in a beehive to try, in our case anyway, and try and, you know, get as much honey as possible out of them. 
but um, yeah. we're, we're there to protect both. And like we we would have we we told all the members of our association and the FIBCA to try and spot uh, wild colonies and report them to Galway, so they could then go out and investigate them. The same as roof ones, you know, where people are getting renovations on Galway, and there was some of the department mentioned yesterday. I think it's it's not Daffam. I think it's the Department of Rural Development or something. They have to be informed as well so they can say, oh, where all the wild colonies are, you know. Mm -hmm. Again, we don't want those wild colonies uh, watered down with hybrids, you know. But it is a very hard question to answer. And, you know, but it's not that we're not up for those bees. We're, we're all for them. Like, if if Ireland was just full of wild native Irish Irish black bee colonies. Happy days. We've won our war, you know. Brilliant. Uh, right, whether they're right. in beehives or not, we don't care. Once book fast bees aren't flying around, you know. Mm -hmm. Well, and I'm I'm this kind of touches upon the next question, which is these are both from Anthony. Um, you know, are there any rogue queen breeders that could be using other stock or that have been smuggled in? And are there any beekeepers that are possibly taking a different approach um, that you may, Look, or, uh, yeah, that you're aware of. Loads, we've guys with 300 beehives. We have a fellow that comes in in a truck, he 15 million bees, he drives to Italy every year. Mm. Um, he goes to England, he makes an awful lot of money selling nukes and queens. I think I worked out he makes about 280,000 pound a trip. Um, so why would that bother me if he's doing that in England? So when we voted for Nice and all of these things and became Europe, so Ireland supposedly is the same as Germany, same, well, when I was voting, I thought we'd all be paying the same tax and everything. It never happened. Um, but we've watered down Europe now. So everything was free trade and all of this. Um, supposedly now you can we have a thing called Kerry gold here it's butter so it's about 420 euro a pound now if you go to uh dusseldorf airport you can buy it for a euro so i don't know what's going on there but brexit came in now when right. brexit when brexit came in you cannot drive a truck full of bees into england anymore mm. you can transport a queen but you cannot bring bees in. I'm not too sure what how that came about, but it did. Um, I think someone did tell me once, I should really know. But anyway, you cannot do that. So <clears throat> what the mass importers into England are doing now is they're driving to Rosslair in Ireland from France, from you know, coming up from Italy through France. It's all Europe, drive straight into Ireland. Now I think they may need are supposed to have health certificates then they drive across the border into northern ireland which as i was saying earlier is then the uk so it'd be like driving from i don't know florida to uh pennsylvania or something you, you you've crossed the state line but mm -hmm. no one's actually put down a barrier the roads into northern ireland they just use you know, the speed changes there's no police anymore or army there you just drive in um they get the ferry on from Stranraer to Larne and then drive down into England and sell all the bees now they do stop here and let them have a little rest and that's where the problem comes in because bees get out they don't some of them don't return to the hives and they're pure Italian bees you know and our really big worry at the moment isn't uh, uh, we've how would I put this? I tend to him and Harla. I apologize. Um, a new thing is coming. It's not just the hybridization. They have a thing called hive beetle in Italy. Mm. And I've seen them in action. And they're like little herds of cows. And um, they totally decimate your hive. Now, they have all sorts of traps and they spend all year catching them now if they come in varroa mites are going to be like nothing 
these things are horrendous. So by bringing in these Italian bees, they're going to bring in hive beetles, you know? So that's another thing we're trying to stop. But the, our big problem has come since Brexit is guys bringing stuff in basically through the back door. Uh, but we do also have chaps, they tend to be Eastern European, I'm not trying to be racist there or anything, who have 300 hives, they're filling IBCs full of honey, um, they're commercial, they're very, very, very good beekeepers, but they don't care what the bees are once they're producing loads of honey from them. Mm -hmm which we're trying to stop as well you know right like we, we don't mind these guys having 300 beehives and making a living but just please try and do it with native irish black bee you know mm -hmm. i've got one more question for you and then we'll kind of switch to asking both of you um one of them was you know it has roderick had shared that they've done some genetic analysis um on their bees have, do you all do that as well with your with your bees to um, sort of corroborate or, or uh, oh, we've just done really a huge confirm one. your yeah, your we've stuff. just done a huge one where every apiary nearly sent off forty samples to Galway, and then they were also sent to a place called Bee Bites. I think they're in Scotland where they analyse the antennae for DNA. Um, now. I've seen the graphs, but I, we don't officially have the officially have the data back yet because the first we sent off samples of sixty of those pots, samples of thirty were removed and sent the uh, bee bites and other tests. Then that Galway did. It was a disaster. Apparently. Uh, uh, all the stuff to bee bites got held up in post strikes in England. The reagent didn't work. There's an endless list of stuff that happened, apparently. So all those samples were basically, it was a disaster. So just before Christmas, because they'd only sent 30 of the 60, just before Christmas, um, they sent the other 30 off. They still had them. They were still okay you know they were as good as the other samples do you know what i mean mm -hmm. um so they have gone off and we're just getting the results back now now some of them are kind of odd in this on the color so yellow spots are yellow stripes okay um we had big failures but as i was saying before uh when the DNA analysis was done, it didn't actually prove that it was a yellow stripey buckfast bee. It was actually a apis mellifera mellifera uh, black bee, even though it had a yellow spot. Um, so there was three graphs on that, the morphology as well. And the, you know, by the way, I'm not a doctor or professor or anyway, like a scientist, I'm only telling you what I've heard. So you know, don't take what I'm saying as kind of, oh, this guy really knows medicine or anything. I don't, I'm afraid. But I'm You just, just play a, a beekeeper on passing, TV, right? A bee breeder. <laughs> I'm just passing on what I know, what I've been told. So of, of the graphs I've seen that have come back, we basically have blue lines saying that AMMs and red lines saying that they're non-native or they, they've got some sort of mix. And we've got kind of 90% on the blue and maybe 10 and on the other graph then about 89% in the blue saying the native and um, just a couple of red lines. Now, that isn't all the samples back. So we need more of the samples back to actually give a definitive thing. But they were very surprised. Mm -hmm. They said they couldn't believe the high percentage of native Irish honeybee that came back, you know. Yeah, go ahead, Roderick. I'm just a point on European law. It is possible for a country to declare um, that only one subspecies is allowed. Uh, and the, the, it has happened already in Slovenia. Uh, when they joined the European Union, they specified that they wanted this law 
um, to be enshrined in their agreement to join the European Union, where only the Carnica B, the Carniolan B, was allowed. And they've managed to, um, it's the only country in Europe where they've actually succeeded in having legal protection for the local B, which is great. So it is possible in European law. Yeah, and yeah, I think that, that, um, that that's something that, there's, I want to say there's varying efforts in different organizations, um, you know, looking at what are these land race strains, right? And how can they be conserved? Because there's something to be said about not losing those distinct um, lineages, really. Um, but course, then yeah. how they how they relate to everything else is, yeah, it's, it's much more complex than I think people realize. And especially when we look at here stateside where bees are moved very willy nilly, you know, um, we see the sort of fallout from all of that because you have people who are, you know, purchasing bees. Um, and I loved what actually what <laughs> one of the words that Roderick used in his presentation was, you know, it became fashionable to start getting these bees from these other places or these different strains. And so, you know, we kind of refer to that here stateside as being, you know, it's the trend factor, it's trendy to do that. Um, and people may not necessarily realize, you know, what it's a marketing type thing, but that also ties into um, what John was talking about, because there is within that marketing, within this sort of native Irish honey, you get this, you know, this badge and this sticker, there's um, a sense of pride that comes along with that. And also it's, it's a declaration of origin, which I think is really um, interesting and actually quite important. I mean, we, not to get totally off base here, but we see that with honey importations, you know, there's a big push for these country of origin so that people can become more educated about the distinctness, you know, as we go really kind of global or globalization has, you know, sent this wave across the world, um, we tend to forget where things come from and um, the significance of history. It's, it's very important, which is one of the reasons why I was really excited um, that you both accepted my invitation to join us today because I, uh, I know at least for American audiences, and of course I'm, I can't speak for everybody, but until we really become more, I want to say, um, exposed to the history behind our bees, where they came from, how they moved, how industrialized agriculture um, really has played a role in that. You know, we have some larger scale commercial beekeepers or commercial uh, queen producers who are really phenomenal at what they do, but in terms of actual breeding and selection, um, you know, there's a lot that our young country can learn. And, and when we think about how this fits into the larger scheme of sustainability um, and really looking at, especially, you know, now with these shifting climate and extreme weather scenarios, what really is of best interest to the bees, right? And therefore would allow beekeepers to have a sustainable livelihood or to be able to persist. Um, this kind of brings me to the next question for both of you too, um, about the black bee in the face of climate change. Oh, go ahead, John. Go Sorry, ahead. can I just come in there before anyone sure, forget? Sure, sure. Sorry, just uh, thanks, Roderick, for that uh, statement. Uh, I've written it down um, be, because I, I need to push it again. So the thing about Slovenia, um, we also have the Isle of Man, uh, you get put in jail there, and Colin says, you know, as a reserve there. So now they have their own little government as well. I'm not too sure if they'll actually beat you. I think I think they allow I think they allow flogging still. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So um we've brought all this to the government's attention here. And the problem is, is you just get a blank. You don't get oh really a yes or a no, and we just we keep pushing it, you know. Uh, but thanks for bringing it up because I may not have known about it. But I, and, and I think there's somewhere up near Denmark or somewhere as well. Now it's not the country, but they've isolated an area where they've actually banned um, imports as well. So our big thing is the UK, uh, England, Scotland, Wales. They're about 50-50 or 40-60. I don't know, but they basically they can't pull back now they're interbred that's it they, they can't you know they've coined a uh, phrase um um nearly black bees haven't they they've, they've, they've given up on yeah, pure black bees uh, yeah but they, 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 they're at the point of no return now our problem is we're not so as far as we're concerned like 
the black bee has been driven all the way out of Europe up into Ireland. And if it goes from here, well, and, and Normandy, and Normandy, please. And Normandy, yeah. So we're trying to just protect that bit, you know. Uh, the, we're only a small island, an island, and um, well, we're probably Normandy's probably a similar size. I, I no, no, uh, Normandy's half the surface area of the Republic. All right, I was hoping you weren't going to say it was ten times the size. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, and especially with us being an island as well, we've some way of protecting protecting them. You know, that this guy really wants to get hold of me. I know. Well, it's nighttime there. They're they're. Hey, can I can I pick up on? I don't even pick, know where that phone can is. Can I pick up on the other question, uh, Melanie? Yeah, yeah, sorry. sorry. Yes, I, just, I just wanted to come in on turn, that one. Turn, turn your phone off. Um, <laughs> the question about climate change and the future yes. of the bee. Very interesting one. Um, France, as you know, has got a, a, a large country with a very variable climate. The climate in the south is quite different from up here in the north. And with the climate change, the south of France is becoming more and more like North Africa. Really long, dry spells. Um, the vegetation is not producing as much nectar as it used to. And we're very worried in the north, not so much for the how the black bee will cope with climate change, but how migratory beekeeping keepers might be attracted to come further north to where they can find flowers to make honey. Mm -hmm. And when they arrive with two or three hundred um, Buckfast hives is going to wipe out our, our, our bees very, very quickly. Yeah? And that's what our big worry is. We've got to have some protection for, against migratory beekeeping. I, I hear you. And it's I walk between two sort of worlds in that respect, because within my own bee breeding program here in the southern Rocky Mountains in northern New Mexico, um, I, you know, we have, we don't actually have a lot of localized production just because it's a, a really, um, I want to say extreme topography here. So where deserts and the plains and the mountains all meet, but we have um, extreme temperature swings just between day and night, uh, year round, you know. And um, I I keep kind of creeping farther and farther up the mountain to I actually rely on the topography to to have these isolated mountain breeding grounds, and that actually you know has been referenced. Um, by a number of people, but Morse and um, Page actually wrote, I call it the blue Bible of, of queen bee breeding um, a number of years ago that kind of talked about what they saw as the future of these sort of more remote sites with which folks can then um, try to manage, you know, especially if you want to do more open mating systems. But yeah, we have, we don't have a lot of localized production. So we have what I call these big bee flippers who, you know, are, are commercial in nature and they sort of bring these packages and bees in from you know, California, um, Texas, all these other places, um, and unsuspecting folks, you know, think, oh, this is, all these are the same, or they may, you know, assume that it's, it's not necessarily what they're doing in their backyard isn't going to affect anybody else. And so um, there's a big effort to kind of push forth education. I mean, I just share that as an example in my area. But then I also do see it. I mean, and this kind of reflects on Anthony's comment in the um, Q&A about the climate change question is that, you know, will commercial beekeepers actually uh, fare better? Will their bees fare better because of those movements? And I think we have to remember that Yes, I mean, when we're looking at flower specific pollinators or bee species, when that resource for them is impacted by shifting climate, then there may be a real sort of drop off. But when we're talking about honeybees or Apis mellifera, they are generalists. And Roderick showed this in, you know, his presentation, which we referenced that, you know, re research paper that looked at migration theories. And, you know, these are all the same at their core, the same bee, this is Apis mellifera, right? And so their ability to adapt and across landscapes, across continents really, um, shows that they have that ability for this phenotypic plasticity or this ability to really shift with varying climates. And so I think on the one hand, you know, it's it's twofold. Yes, migratory beekeeping is sending bees to different places, but it doesn't necessarily show that they're surviving those places over long, you know, over the long haul, um, because adaptation yeah, but, takes, but my, takes but my generations. Point was, yeah, but my point yeah. was, as John, as John mentioned, the, 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 just the simple arrival 
even on a temporary basis of those migratory bees yeah that can ruin a breeding program that's locally yep. you know happening locally. I totally agree. Yeah, because and people don't realize that because you're when you have bees in your backyard, they're just not in your backyard, right? <laughs> they're mingling with all sorts of other bees and and you know talking about the importation threats of um, small hive beetles, other pest and disease, you know um, uh, issues that come into play. Um, you know that's it's a lot of education is needed, I think, for people to to really think about you know. What is their role as their, as a steward, as a beekeeper? You know, is it just to have bees to have any kind of bee, or is it really to have bees that are a part of your landscape? And if you are um, a non sedentary beekeeper or, or migratory in some sense, you know, what does that mean for where you're moving your bees and to the area with which you're moving them to and those beekeepers there? And there's no, I think, um, simple answer to this, but I think it it does behoove us to really think about this. Um, and what that means, you know, on a on a global scale, even, you know, from local, from your backyard to the sort of international stage. Um, here's a question. And I know we're we've been on a while, so I don't want to um, I mean, we could talk all day about bees, I know, but it's getting pretty late. For oh, you yeah. All there. <laughs> and John's in high demand. He's, you know, getting lots of phone calls, calling him out. So I don't want to keep everybody longer than necessary. But no, I know no, that this I, is good. I, time, I've, got, so. I've got rid of them now. It's OK. Yeah. Um, so let's see here. Uh, any thoughts on why some colonies transition to winter bees and overwinter successfully while others plow through their stores before midwinter? Yes. About early. Yes, absolutely. It's, it's selection. You've got bees like the Italian, the Ligustica, and the Buckfast, who is basically a Ligusta with modifications. They don't know when to stop laying eggs and they use up their supplies as if there's no tomorrow, um, which is fine if you live in Italy where the climate is mild and there's always some, uh, some flowers uh, around to, to gather more nectar, but it'd be hopeless in Northern Europe. Um, I mean, I know that in Ireland, um, I listened to one of a conference by your colleague in Galway, and she was saying that it rains at some point every day, except in the, the drought of 19, uh, 2022, but um, generally they reckon on rain every day. That's no climate for an Italian bee, it, uh, and it would just use up its supplies all the time. Um, there's no point in having it. So it's yeah. genetics. It's genetic. It's ecotype. It's it's a, a selection of the right breed of bee for the right climate. Simple as that. Simple as that. Yeah, right. I fully agree. Yeah. Uh, another thing I get asked, Melanie, is why do you care? Why don't you just let all these bees come in and just let them get on with it and show what the hell? <laughs> You know, let these fellas crossbreed these bees. Now, I'm appalled by that and very scared because someone did that. Now, I may get the country wrong, and I know they crossed an African bee with some other type of bee. Brazil. And Yeah, they went to Brazil with, I think, 26 hives, was it? They escaped. Like they You're breaking up there. Sorry, they escaped from a lab. Um, yeah, but well, was it about 26 hives? It wasn't like a no, million no. or anything. And, yeah. and, they, and they quickly crossed with the local Brazilian bees and it was a disaster. And they became American, uh, what they call the killer bees now. Uh, uh, Afri Af Africanized bees, yeah. Yeah, which actually killed so many people a year in America. So that's my... That's what I would say to someone who says, oh, why don't you just let these people do what they want? And sure, if they bring in crossbred, you know, on, on a small scale like that. Yeah, but more importantly, whole... John, more importantly, hmm? John, we, we as the human race have, haven't got the right to exterminate a high entire species. It's yeah. there. It was there a long time before we were. Hmm. And it's perfectly adapted to its environment. It's not our, not our right to make it disappear by genetic yeah. pollution or by other means. Well, yeah, now, and, uh, I, and I agree with you, John. I mean, I'm yeah. not I'm actually not for willy nilly breeding. Um, I've just happened to live in a country where it has been really willy nilly. So I'm kind of inheriting this scenario. And within, you know, again, speaking for myself, trying to work on a localized um, or regionally adaptive strain, um, it goes against the grain, especially just um, in terms of the sort of popular and conventional nature. 
as it has developed over time here in this country. So I I really look to efforts such as the ones that you and um, Roderick are doing because I find that not only to be informative, but it helps me to recognize what that importance is of finding your um, locally adapted strains and in and in working towards conserving them and and being able to educate others as to the importance of that. So I'm right there with you on all of that. I think, um, you know, one of the reasons that um, it, it's, well, we don't have to go into all of the historical context as to why that's happened here stateside, but, you know, the fact that the bees have adapted and become these localized land race strains, um, that's just a, that's a marvelous feat of nature, right? And exactly like Roderick was saying, who are we to go in and just kind of mess that up, right? And so um, it is just a lot for us to think about because we have, you know, the fashionable and trendy aspects of things and people are on a push to try and find um, resistant stock lines, you know, because they they do struggle. And, and I think when we think about it in, oh, it's just a genetic issue, um, we're not seeing the whole picture. It's also a, a fully environmental issue. It's a land stewardship issue. It's a it's an economic and policy and socio, you know, demographical issue. It really affects all sectors. And that's one of the reasons why I've come to love beekeeping so much is because it um, goes beyond borders. You know, it really connects us to these other situations that are happening in other parts of the world, right? And um, yeah, it's it's a good thing I think to uh, for us to think of. There's a few other questions in the chat, and I know we're we've are, we've been on for two and a half hours, and people got to stretch their legs. Um, I feel like we'll have to have a follow up <laughs> with you all, and I definitely um, plan to reach out. We've we've been talking about reviving our newsletter, and so that would be a wonderful opportunity to. Um, to get some articles in there about your all's work and and for folks to reach out to you more. I know Carrie had a really good question about um, some of the more specific um, uh, limited haplotypes and and um, if you get a chance to yeah, oh, yeah, I've, answering excellent. Yeah, yeah so, I've got a, I've got a a little picture I can send her with the haplotypes that we found in the Calvados department great. and uh, there's quite a lot. <laughs> it's surprising because yeah, they've been is. here for so long. Um, <laughs> Garnery, Professor Garnery explained to me they've been here so long that every once in a thousand generations you get a new haplotype uh, evolving naturally mm -hmm. and in a population that's been stable in a region for thousands we, we reckon it's been eight eight thousand years ten thousand years they've been here there's a whole bunch of haplotypes that have evolved and it's a it's a sign of how long they've been here one little point the United States didn't have honeybees before the arrival of the um, the European settlers. It's a it's an invasive species in itself, um, and I don't think you should ever forget that the twelve thousand years American Indians were living on the continent with no honeybees. Their only source of sugar was maple syrup and uh, honey ants and stuff like that. You know, but they the the, the no, am I wrong? Well, we did well, have I, I, no. You I, are I, correct. I, I, you I are correct. Agree but with you there, yeah. yeah, yeah, buffalo. Yeah. <laughs> You know, there, but, but, there are but, stingless honeybees in the southern parts of the United States. Sure, I've heard about them, yes, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and we did have, and, actually, there's and, fossil and evidence of, ago, um... oh, go ahead. 40 million years ago, there was honeybees in North America. Yeah. Really? Wow. wow. Yeah, so there's fossil not, evidence not, of not them apis being prolific. Not apis prolifa, though. Yeah, no, no. I, I, I think, though, the point that's been made, the Native American Indian, I don't know if that's the correct word anymore, s buffalo meat, they didn't grow strawberries and things. You know, bees weren't part of their lifestyle. So this is one I had to tell people when they say, oh, the bees dying out, let's save the bee and everything. And they say, oh, you, you must be really up for it and all this because you're in nibs. And, and I say, no, no, like, we won't all die if bees die out. I said, it would be nice if we could all not let them die out. But I said, you won't die. You can just eat buffaloes, you know? But you won't have strawberries or vegetables or apples or anything anymore. But you'll just have to eat meat. 
Totally you can. Well, and, let the and bees die out if you want. You know, as <laughs> so that's the way I try and in. simplify <laughs> that one, you know. Hey, hey, but John, where will I get my cranberries to put on my breakfast cereal in the morning? <laughs> there will be well, no and, cereal. You'll be eating uh, a buffalo's hoof. <laughs> right. And just to share, as someone who's beaming in from the Institute of American Indian Arts here, where I work in our Ag Extension program, there are numerous numerous indigenous foods that were here pre-colonization and those actually include potatoes tomatoes chocolate all of those are actually indigenous foods from quote unquote the americas but they were um shared and then became more famous because of you know these other um cultures but they're there were a lot of foods and I don't want to get us too off topic, but I, I yeah, hear you and what you're saying I, in I, terms I, of, you know, this sort of honeybees I, have really become. I think you might have sent us a few child. potatoes. What's that? I think you might have sent us a few potatoes some years ago. We, yeah, there we go. <laughs> there we go. But yeah, there's um there's something to be said about, you know, this exploited poster child, the honeybee, you know, Apis mellifera, which really has... um become a huge fascination for Americans, not only American, but globe globally for cultures around the world. And so there's this longstanding stewardship and relationship that is developed over time. And um, thank you both so much for sharing um, your perspectives and your projects. I think this is, you know, we've only barely scratched the surface with this type of conversation, but I'd love to continue um, and to share more information. And so I think um, we're going to wrap it up for today. And yes, thank you so much, John. I'm going to do one more little share. I think if I can pull it up here, I don't know if I have it. Thank it was you. just my was little pleasure. thank you Thanks slide. So <laughs> thank you. Yeah, it was just my little thank you slide. Um, thanking you for, for both coming today. And yeah, no if problem. folks have questions, feel free to, um, feel free to, you know, reach back out. So thank you very much to Thanks both Roderick much. Wheatley and John. Thank you. Yeah, have a good a pleasure, evening. Yeah. I know it's late there. <laughs> Talk to you again. No, it's not late. It's, it's, no, it's, it's only half seven or something. Uh, it's half oh, a state in, half a state in France. But oh, yeah, okay. th thank you very much for inviting us. It's great. Yeah, yeah. we enjoyed it. Yeah, yeah thank, thank you. you all so much. Lots of cool conversations to come. I know we'll revisit I'm this sure. again. De so. Definitely. Take care, thank everybody. You. Thank you. Okay. Bye. 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 Bye.